Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse Kelly, and I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Civil Liberties and Criminal Justice at the R Street Institute. We produce research and commentary on public policy related to all stages of the justice system, including policing, pretrial policy, sentencing, incarceration, juvenile justice, and reentry. Thank you so much for joining us today for this two-part discussion on why and how policymakers should support family connections during incarceration. We'll be taking questions from those attending, so please use the Q&A function so that we can be sure to answer all of the questions you may have. There will be time for questions after both the first and the second panels. Our first panel will focus on how family connection directly impacts those who are incarcerated and their families. Leading this discussion will be Marcus Bullock, an entrepreneur and justice reform advocate. Following his 2004 release from prison, Marcus launched a construction company that grew to employ other returning citizens. Marcus is also the founder of Flickshop, a software company that builds tools to help incarcerated people stay connected to their families and build community. Joining the conversation is Jennifer Toon. Jennifer is a formerly incarcerated criminal justice advocate who was born and raised in East Texas. She studied journalism at the University of Houston. Jennifer has written for the state prison newspaper, The Echo, for over 10 years. And as a freelance writer, she's published work with the Texas Observer and the Marshall Project. Rachel Reese is a criminal defense attorney based in Tampa, Florida. In her practice, Rachel takes special care to make sure that her clients and their families are well informed of the judicial process. She graduated from both Stetson University College of Law and Florida State University. Denise Rock is the executive director of Florida Cares, a nonprofit corporation dedicated to improving the lives of incarcerated individuals. Denise has a background working as a paralegal and as a criminal defense investigator. Under her leadership, Florida Cares was able to successfully organize hundreds of family members of incarcerated people to speak out against a proposed rule that would have made it easier for the Florida Department of Corrections to cut visitation. Marcus, thank you so much for leading this conversation and I'll pass the proverbial mic over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jesse, for, uh, for introducing me this way. Um, I'm always excited to be able to join in conversations with, with R Street. Uh, I encourage all of you guys who are joining in this afternoon, this afternoon to jump in the Q&A section inside of, uh, inside, of your, inside of your Zoom screens. And we encourage you to ask questions. We, we would like to this, for this to become a big, massive dialogue that I think that's going to really shape the way uh, that we think about uh, making sure that, you know, poly, policymakers understand how best they can support people who are incarcerated. Um, I'll try as best I can, <clears throat> excuse me, to, not, to, to jump in and get, answer any of those questions. But I, what I really want to do is highlight the folks uh, who are on this call and make sure that they have the voice to be able to help inform a lot of the decision makings that are happening, especially as we enter new administrations, um, new correction departments, like all of these things that major changes are happening around the country. Um, and you guys are going to be instrumental. Uh, so thank you guys also for all for joining me in this conversation today. Let's have some fun. I'm going to jump straight into the questions. And initially, I'm going to start with Denise. Now, Denise, I'm going to talk a little bit about Flick Shop and the the work that we do and how we work to support families. One of the things I get excited about is uh, meeting organizations that are working on uh, working directly with the families and how they experience uh, making maintaining those connections. So Denise, let's jump straight in. Can you tell me how has your experience been with working directly with families as they think about um, how to connect with each, each, each other while they're incarcerated and even how you support children with incarcerated parents? I know that Florida Care spends a, a bit of time working on this issue. So if you can tell us a little bit about Florida Care's charity and, and, and what you guys are, are thinking that's important, especially as we enter the holiday season, that would be awesome. Sure, absolutely. I have to tell you, by the way, as my pictures are my favorite thing in the world. So like I'm a big uh, flick shop fan because I think pictures are huge and they are so important in incarceration. You know, they really keep... Um, <clears throat> the person feeling present and, and through the, the process of, of growing, like as your children are growing, the more pictures they receive, the, <clears throat> you know, they, they feel like they're not missing anything, you know. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of pictures. It's so important. 
uh, Florida Care is, you know, was built on the back of visitation. <clears throat> we formed Florida Care shortly before uh, the visitation rule challenge started, but once the visitation rule challenge started, that is when people really came together because <clears throat> the Department of Corrections was attempting to take visitation from, what was that 12, 24, at 48 hours a month down to about four hours a month. It was under different leadership with Julie Jones. Um, and that was a big thing and families were really upset about it. And so we really came together then. And <clears throat> once we were able to overcome that, that really what was meant to divide uh, prisoners and families actually joined us together and, and brought people together and brought families together. <clears throat> and we began to work together to figure out what else could we do to improve um, people that are incarcerated and families' lives as well. <clears throat> and we've learned things um, that we can do all to help each other. Um, just to give you an example, one of the things that we did uh, last summer, we, we do it every summer, is a back to school project <clears throat> where uh, an incarcerated parent will send a request that they would like a backpack to go to uh, their child. And we will fill the backpack with school supplies. And we covered the entire state of Florida for the entire prison system. So you can imagine these packages are flying all over the place. And last summer, we delivered 709 packages and we've mailed like less than 20, okay? How did we do this? We did this through the visitors parks. Everything was gathered in West Palm Beach at our central office and packaged up here. And then um, on Fridays, uh, we would load the cars up of people in West Palm Beach that were going to the various prisons in different cities. And on Saturdays, they would meet in the parking lots and hey, who lives in Jacksonville? Who lives in Tallahassee? And who lives here? And people wanted to bring these packages to the doors of, of the family, you know, of the child of the incarcerated person. And um, yeah, we were able to deliver 700 packages like that. It's incredible how much families came mm -hmm. together and really wanted to help other people, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I think that is a, a testament to the goodness that there is in society and in the families of the incarcerated and in incarcerated individuals. You know, I say that to the <clears throat> administration and to our policymakers <clears throat> about COVID, for example, you know, in our state, nobody has uh, rioted or done anything uh, <clears throat> uh, crazy inside of the prisons. There's not been any, any kind of violence for the most part. They have just accepted what has happened to them and what's, ex what's been done is, <clears throat> you know, extremely restrictive for an extremely long time. And that's a, that is a testament to the good of the people that are in, incarcerated. And we tend to think that everybody in there is monsters and they're not, so. No, no, no. thank you so much for pointing that out. I mean, you're right. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I mean, I served eight years in prison. I went to prison when I was a 15 year old kid. Um, and my, the way that my judge sentenced me, he sentenced me that, that to directly to adult maximum security. I was certified as an adult really early. And so um, I, I was forced to have to go through that. So I can, in, in, in growing up as a kid with parents out in the community, um, it was important to me to not only maintain those, those connections, but the hearing how you guys are doing, working with packages and getting other items in. I mean, that's going to be interesting. I, th I think I want to, I want to hang ahead there. I want to come back to that because I think that's important to know logistically, how did you guys make that happen? And I don't know if it's something that happened in Florida that made it, have, gave you a more unique experience, but you know, I don't know if everyone has similar experiences. Jennifer, I'm going to pivot over to you, um, and I want to I want you to jump in here um, because you wrote an amazing article about you know your experience and um, the role that your parents uh, you know the roles your parents had while while you were actually in prison, um, and, and saying that you really needed that for hope and encouragement while you were there. Did you have a similar experience to what Denise is describing for the folks that the families that want to support? Like how was how was the incarceration process? How did it impact you or your family um, while you were there? So um, thank you, and I'm, it's my pleasure to be here. And it's really cool to meet you because I read this fantastic article about Flick Shop, and I was like, man, that, when one of us succeeds, um, all of us can. And so I just I commend you for that, and I, I just want to tell you, you know, thank you um, for for everything that you've done. Um, 
So how did how did incarceration impact me and my family? Um, so <laughs> I think the the first thing that I can say about that is that it impacted our mental health, our emotional well being, and um, right. you know you talk about data and and how people succeed with connections, and and I really want to be that voice today to talk about lived experience and saying. I know that the only thing that helped me be rehabilitated to succeed, um, to connect to my own community were my connections with my family because without that, it kind of, you know, uh, my spirit just would wither and, and, and feel like it was dying without that. And, um, you know, my, my parents did what they could. I was locked up too at the age of 15 um, until I was 25 years old and then uh, I was, Reoffended and was locked back up when I was 30 until I was about 39. So I did a total of almost 19 years in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice uh, in, in the juvenile system as well. And it was really hard for my family um, to come, you know, because Texas is big, just like Florida uh, and California and places like that. It's, it's, it's such a big state that, that it took my parents, you know, four hours one way to come visit. And, uh, you know, they did what they could. And I, I'm very grateful to have the family um, that I have because it, it really is difficult for people who are incarcerated and their families to stay connected. And it's, but that's the thing that rehabilitates uh, us or at least, you know, for me. And, um, you know, Texas wasn't, wasn't, was one of the last states to put phones in, into our prison system. And that was maybe, maybe about 10 years ago. Um, so it, it, it has not been easy and it is not easy um, for the men and women in TDCJ. It, you, you know, as you were talking about Florida Cares, we, we had a program and it comes to mind now and it was called uh, the Storybook Project uh, where an outside agency volunteers would come in and the mothers, I'm, I'm not a mother, but a lot of the women that I was locked up with are. And so, uh, they would read stories. They could pick out a book and keep the book and mail it to their children and they would read it to them and they would record it and mail it home. And to see the women respond to that and how their children respond, how they stayed out of trouble to make sure that they go, go to that program once a month. Um, it, and I know several of the women that participated in that program and I just see that they have healthier outcomes uh, than, the, than the women that were unfortunately not able um, to see their children as often. So, um, you know, it, it just, <laughs> it, it, it's so important for us to stay connected um, to our families. No, I mean, thank you. I mean, I think one of the things I think is interesting in Texas, um, specifically in the um, T, TDCJ, yeah. right, TDCJ. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing I think is interesting is the new inspect to protect uh, regulation that, that, that they launched. And, and, I, and you address this, Inside of your inside of your article, um, what do you think these kinds of regulations mean for the families uh, when 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 these new rollouts happen? And, and if you could take a take a quick second to 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 help the rest of the the audience understand what the, the inspect to protect um, program did uh, for for the residents there, that would be helpful as well. Sure. So um, inspect to protect uh, was some policy changes at the beginning of the year around March for uh, revisions to mailroom policies. And what that meant was that um, they would ban greeting cards, birthday card, any type of card, um, anything that had color paper, anything with colored ink. It would limit um, being able to send in photos to only 10 photos per envelope. So unless it is a letter on a white sheet of paper with black ink in a white envelope, you're getting it denied. Um, and they, what they said was, you know, we have all this uninspectable mail, this with suspicious substances on that, you know, and, and uh, so every year they get about 7.5 million pieces of mail, according to TDCJ, and about 42,000 pieces of that mail is uninspectable, right? Well, that definition is pretty broad. It doesn't necessarily mean drugs for the, for the most part, and especially the 19 years I was locked up, it usually meant crayon pictures that kids drew for their mom with glitter on it or buttons or, or homemade glue or something like that. So that leaves, you know, 7.4 million other pieces of mail um, that are subject to, to denial. And the, and the impact is less family connection. 
uh, less interaction with children, with parents, with siblings. Um, and those were our lifelines. And I'm sure Marcus, you could speak to this too. It's like, I live for mail call every day. And um, when that doesn't happen, my mental health will deteriorate and deteriorate fast. And, and that's really hard for people on the outside to, you know, because when this first passed, a, a lot of people were like, well, you know, what's the big deal? It's in the name of safety, you know, because, you know, a lot of times correctional facilities, when they want to do something, all they have to do is wrap it around, you know, security. And it just may mean that it's easier for them. And uh, families and, and those who are incarcerated suffer for that. So, you know, a lot of people were like, I don't understand. So what, you couldn't get a birthday card. Well, let me tell you something, that birthday card that, that my father sent me once a year, a very stoic man that doesn't like to express the way he feels, just to open that card and see his handwriting and, and mm -hmm. where he's written, I love you, I miss you. Um, that's fun, that's huge for my dad. And um, those days that I wanted to give up, you know, I'd pull that card out and just rub my hands over his signature and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Um, God, give me strength um, not to disappoint this man anymore um, that travels four hours one way to see me. And um, that was what got me through. And that's what gets me through uh, today. And, and without that type of connection, and it sounds so simple, right? A birthday card, um, you know, that you see on the aisles when we could go to stores, uh, you know, just like, it, okay, it's a card, but for us, it was, it was everything. It was a lifeline. You know, what's interesting. I love that you, I love that you talked about that. I love that you mentioned mail call and what that meant for you guys, because I think that for, for the audience members that have never been incarcerated, I mean, they need to hear that. They need to hear what it looks like every day at 4 PM during mm -hmm. yeah. when mail call happens and the CO is walking down the wing and they're screaming out names and yours isn't called. Yeah. What that means when yours is called, when your name is called, and whether or not you receive, you know, a handwritten letter, a greeting card, a birthday card, uh, a flick shop postcard, any of those, it just it, it lightens, brightens your day immediately. One of the things I'm quoted for saying, you know, often is getting mail in prison is like hitting the lottery, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the moment that everybody in the cell is waiting for. We're all waiting for that moment to hear it. And here's the interesting thing I think about this, right? Because the folks who say that, you know, like, oh, it's just a greedy car. Oh, it's just the picture. Oh, it's just, here's the thing. If you were to strip each of us from all of our connections, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, email, texting, phone calls, any of those kinds of connections, and said that you could only receive some sort of communication with another person at 4 p.m. every day, all of us across the globe will be looking forward to 4 p.m. to have that kind of, you know, mental stimulation and love that we, you know, that we are looking for, we all plan for it. And I think that while we understand the values, well, we, sorry, because I wasn't talking to you, because we <laughs> understand the value of social media in our lives, I think it should be, you would think that it would be natural for the world to understand the value of family connectivity because a double tap from someone will literally save you from making a horrible decision the same way that a greeting card can prevent you from making a horrible decision so i'm so grateful that that, that you that you pointed that out one of the other things that i think that, that i heard from you um is you talked about that just a tangible piece of mail that you're receiving and you can run your hands across it. i think there's something to be said there and we all recognize like you know the, there were these new security restrictions that we're going to roll out these new tech, you know, these new technology options and what have you. And while those are awesome, because I'm a fan of these new tech, obviously, right? I'm a fan of these new technologies that are being brought out to these facilities. But you feel like you come home and you see these photos on your wall, right above your mantle, at the top of your stairs, in your bedroom, sometimes all the way in your bathroom, the same way that people themselves want to be able to feel that same level of love. I want to piggyback over to you because you're our, you're our, uh, our resident attorney on this call. <laughs> Being a defense attorney and having an opportunity to not engage with just one or two or 10, but several clients across the board that, um, that experience a lot of what we're talking about now. I'm sure you have a very unique um, position and out and outlook on um, a part of this conversation. And so I, I wanted to ask you very specifically if you could talk about 
what you have heard um, about the family connection and the, the, the process that you even have to go through in order to be able to facilitate a connection um, with your, either your client or with the family members of some of your clients? Sure. Um, glad to be here. Um, so obviously for my, I have all my clients are in prison, um, state of Florida and otherwise federal. So they're all over the country. And the procedures are pretty different between the two, but the, gen the general um, requirements are the same. So it's, it's easier for me to communicate with my clients and with inmates in general, even inmates who are not my clients yet. So I can reach out to inmates that are thinking about hiring me um, or may have maybe have information about one of my cases. And it's a lot easier for me to get in touch with them than it is for a family member. So I'll just talk about like my, from my perspective first, um, my office has the ability to literally call up to a prison tomorrow, talk to a member of classification and set up what's called a legal call, non-recorded line, 15 minutes to an hour where the inmate is supposed to be by themselves. You know, sometimes I do this to most of the time it's for legal, but sometimes you know, other stuff comes up that you know, a family member is worried. Um, and as long as I can somehow work my legal case and my representation of them into the call, then I can do the non-recorded call and just kind of check in with them. So that's normally the fastest way that I communicate with them. I do communicate by mail. Um, we have, we go through legal mail as I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with. So we, as long as it's on our firm letterhead, and it's in our firm's envelope, and it doesn't look like it's been tampered with at all, then technically, and it says open in presence of the inmate, technically they're not supposed to open it because we are basically clarifying that there is something in here that is a, is a privileged matter that the inmate needs to be present if you're gonna look through it because otherwise they literally look through all of your mail. Um, and myself and my assistant, you know, we have been contacted multiple times where they'll be like, we got this envelope, is this yours? And we have to go through a whole process of them not even believing that coming from a law firm with known and recognized letterhead, they will try to say that it is not our information, which is so crazy. Just kind of speaking, um, what Jennifer was saying about the stuff in Texas, where they would find these pieces of mail that they said were, you know, questionable, even just coming from a law firm's perspective, we, we get that too, which just drives me crazy. And they'll, they'll return it. And so, yeah, that happens a lot. Um, for my clients and their families, it is extremely difficult because obviously it is easier for me, but it is very frustrating because I have on a daily basis, um, family members that will contact me and they'll say, you know, I cannot get in touch with, we'll say Joe, we, used to, we cannot get in touch with him. We haven't received any letters from him. We haven't received any calls from him. Um, and if they exchange emails through JPEG, we haven't heard from him and that makes it difficult for me because there is only so much that I can do other than set up a legal call or other than send a piece of mail because <clears throat> I can't, unfortunately just can't drive to, especially during COVID and check on them. And we, because the emails are all monitored, we have a strict policy in our office kind of to not use them if we don't have to per se. Um, but again, sometimes I am able to kind of act as an unofficial messenger if there is a problem you know with a family they are like oh my god I haven't heard then sometimes I am able to do that but the one thing that we get the most questions about is families will ask if they can be three-wayed when I do legal phone calls and I always feel terrible because I would love to be like oh my god yes like let's all have a conversation because I've never been able to do that when someone hires me they are already in prison they're already in custody. So I'm not like a normal attorney where you come into my office and you're with your parents or you're with your wife or your husband and you sit down with me and you guys all meet me. So sometimes I never meet the client until years later and I've only met their family. I've only met their family. Um, so they want me to three-way them and we just can't do that. And the prisons in Florida will flag that and they will basically prevent us from being able to communicate with them. So that is difficult. Um, and I know during COVID, I know that Florida tried to make things as easy as possible from what I have heard from my clients and from their families as, as it relates to JPay, you know, some people who couldn't afford to send emails, they gave them free emails and free videos that you can send like a videogram. Um, so I do think to an extent they tried, but I think that it's always just going to be difficult for them to kind of get that communication. Um, we, like I said, we don't send a lot of legal stuff through JPay, but I do communicate with some of my clients when I have more 
pressing matters where I'm like, I cannot talk. I can't wait to set up a call with you or I can't wait for the snail mail because it takes forever. I could send something tomorrow and it will not get even through the legal mail process where it's not supposed to go through all the hands and the opening process. They might not get it until next Friday, which is with deadlines, it gets frustrating for me. Um, but there's on, uh, obviously nothing that I can do about that. But if we ever send something that's non-legal, so every year, um, my assistant and I, for the last probably four years, kind of going off of what Jennifer was saying, you know, that piece of mail, um, we started sending Christmas cards to all of my clients, my current clients, past clients, and, you know, some of the classification officers that have been extremely nice to us and accommodating. So I pay for it out of my own pocket, not my firm's, because I want it to come from us. And we can't send it through legal mail. We've had them return it. If it even mentions that I'm coming from some people, some facilities will see my name and they'll say, this must be legal mail. And it has no insignia on it. It has no legal stamp. I'm like, this is not legal mail. It's personal mail. But they are so strict about you cannot try to put something that's personal into and qualified as legal mail because they just have, they're trying to draw that strict boundary of, you know, between lawyer and friend, I guess, which for me, you know, that's a blurred line. So that gets a little difficult for me. You know, one of the things, I mean, I think it's interesting to hear you, Rachel, talk about, you know, your experience as an attorney and what that looks like, especially, I mean, I remember those days, you know, when you call it, you know, and if I'm being honest, like, you know how many call, how many times I've asked my attorney to make a three-way call for me uh, when, I was, when I was actually in, um, in jail and, and having regular conversations with my attorney. But, but one of the things I wanted to ask you about specifically, like, because we, we, we're talking a lot about humanizing the experience and ensuring that the love and connectivity is there from family and friends. And while I believe, and, and Jennifer pointed toward the accountability that's created once you begin to foster and nurture that relationship with your loved ones, you talked about it with her and her dad. But I, what, what, one of the things I had a question about you was, for you specifically, is around the legal ramification of not being able to easily communicate with folks that are there. Do you think that, I mean, are there, are there major barriers to war, to like the building solutions for cases or how you were thinking about moving forward with one of your clients through, you know, something that you're working on? Are there like issues around the legal ramifications are of, 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 of placing these barriers in, in front of our, in our, our cases? I mean, there, are, there absolutely are. I mean, for me specifically, so the types of cases that I'm handling, I do a lot of post-conviction. So a lot of them, I'm saying that somebody's attorney before me was ineffective. And a lot of times, you know, it's not like a normal appeal. I'm arguing things that are not anywhere in the record. They're based off of conversations that I've had with the client that nobody else knows about. And I can't file anything until I speak with them. So the inability to have, you know, I don't want to say instant communication because that's unrealistic. But during COVID, I mean, a lot of other places have made it kind of instant uh, besides some of, the, some of the prison systems. But the ramifications with that is that if I can't get to them in a specific time or there are, you know, other loopholes to jump through, then sometimes, you know, I have time, I have deadlines and then that does impede on their ability to have good representation. And I can only speak for myself. I know not all attorneys, you know, practice the way that I do and talk to their clients as much as I do. But there it's also comes a point in time where some facilities will say, you've had too many calls lately. You cannot, you can't keep having calls with this person. And some people's cases are very, very in depth and it takes a lot of time. One 20 minute call on one Friday is not enough to go through Joe Smith's entire life. And some of some cases take that. And so they, they tell me, fine, and you need to come up here and visit. And that's an even crazier process that I won't even get into because I don't do it very often. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you know, thank you for that. One of the, you know, and, and I probably should give a little bit of context of why I'm so passionate and energized about this conversation. Um, so for, just for those, uh, the audience members who do not know, Flickshop, you know, I'm the CEO and founder of Flickshop. We built a technology that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and Rachel kind of sort of uh, made it, she kind of sort of teed this up for me to talk about like instant communication. Well, while it's not instant, um, we wanted to be able to make it easy to be able to send um, photos back to people in prison. So this is an example of a, of a flick shop postcard. We use it, this is someone, I, I sent a screenshot last year around this time to say happy holidays. Um, that I took from, you know, off of Instagram. And flick shop works just like Instagram. You add a photo, types of message, like a caption, press in, and we print that actual message 
um, on a real tangible postcard and we ship it to any person in any prison. And we actually, one of the things that we learned that was like massively uh, helpful for our family members was our Flickshop Angels program that allows for the community members to purchase Flickshop credits so that we can help the children with incarcerated parents uh, stay in contact with their mom or their dad completely for free with no cost at all. And it's subsidized by our community. So I'm really excited about in, um, you know, introducing Flickshop Angels uh, and the Flickshop Angels project to more folks uh, in the community. If you, want, if you guys want to find more information about it, you can visit us at flickshopangels.com. But I think that Amy, who in, um, in the chat, she had, thank you, Amy, for jumping in the chat and, and asking this question. Um, and Denise, I'm actually going to push this one over to you. When Amy asked the question about um, figuring out ways to, uh, while we're trying to figure out ways to leverage our technology to you know, help the children stay in contact with their moms or their dads that are in these cells, um, there's so many children around the country uh, who are either nonverbal or uh, they can't, you know, they can't, they don't know how to use them. They're four years old. They can't, well, my four year old knows how to use Flick Shop, like four years old <laughs> nowadays. But, you know, these younger children, they, they aren't able to sit down and write a longer letter or they can't, you know, go grab, um, you know, some, you know, pencil and pen and, or to go to the store and buy envelopes and buy postage. Denise, how have you guys been, how have you guys been thoughtful about, or do you have any advice on meaningful ways that uh, policymakers can, uh, or corrections departments can help um, annihilate some of those barriers that some of these children have uh, with, uh, with connecting with their incarcerated moms and dads, and specifically how Florida thinks about engaging with this part of the community, because obviously you guys, and I've seen on you guys' website, you guys even have these holiday toy drives, how this is important for, for the community. Why and why is it so important? And how do you think that we should move forward with in, in enabling these kinds of connections? Sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> the component of children is uh, super important here in Florida. There's 310,000 children, Florida estimates, that have a parent that's incarcerated here in Florida. So, um, you know, I think that there is no place that is more important than Florida with that many children that, are, that have a, a parent in, incarcerated that where we should be focused at. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't do make any accommodations for the children that are have an incarcerated parent in visitation. There are no there are no toys. <laughs> um, very they're, they're sparse, and a uh, few things are dedicated <clears throat> toward the children at all. So you will have a, a two year old that is playing with you know a deck of playing cards, <laughs> for example. You know because there's nothing there for them to do, and they're not allowed to bring in any toys of their own. Uh, so I think that. The Department of Corrections could do much better in that regard by either a um, having uh, age appropriate toys that are there or b allowing that parent to bring in an age appropriate toy. Yes, it's going to involve them inspecting it, um, but allow them to bring in the toy that, you know, it is a two year old. Um, <clears throat> there, there is um, you could have a visitation um, liaison for, for a prison. You know, we'd, we'd offered to be um, have appointed people that would be like a liaison to be at each prison and say the warden would call and say, hey, we've got, you know, this is our need here at this prison here right now. And let us fulfill that need and, and <clears throat> supply what it is, whatever games they need or toys that they need so that there is something there that they could do. Um, what activities they could they can make activities that could take place. I know at some institutions um, they have TVs that are in the visitation and they would show um, a movie for the children. Um, that's in some of the private institutions that are here in Florida. It's a great idea, you know, something like that, so that you know the incarcerated parent could sit there and you know watch a Disney movie with their with their child, you know. It's a, it's a great idea. Um, there's another prison where they have um, the church band will come out every so often and they'll play music outside and the kids can go out there and dance. It's a great idea. Um, but there, there's just, you know, that is the, you know, one, one place out of 58 uh, major institutions that will do it. It should be across the board. Um, and it's, it's a very rare thing to happen. There's a program here called... Um, Children of Inmates. I could not say enough wonderful things about this program. Um, 
except it doesn't. Yeah, they're awesome. Except it doesn't happen often enough, <laughs> and it doesn't cover all the prisons. That, that's what I would say. That that needs to happen like once a month, and it needs to cover all the prisons um, because it is just a wonderful program, <clears throat> and the bonding experience for the children and the parent. Um, and <clears throat> but the Department of Corrections could take some of those things that they do there. They do the simplest things. They allow the parent and the child to sit on the on the floor together. That moment there, it's huge. I mean, a four-year-old, what's the four-year-old do? He squats all the time, you know? Um, but if if you get down there and squat, you're gonna get yelled at, right? And God forbid if you sit on the grass, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know. And there's all this beautiful grass. Let the people sit on the grass. You know, um, I know there's an. Uh, there, uh, the department may say this is a security issue, but if you inspected them at the front door and you know you did your thorough search, then there's the security issue doesn't exist. Let them sit on the grass, and I think that would be it. Would be huge. No, I mean you're you're hitting the nail on the head. I know we're running up against um, some time restraints here, but, but Jennifer, one, there was a question that came in, and, and I want to get your thoughts on it um, but before we before we let go. But it was it came from someone that's in Wisconsin who, you know, just like the rest of us who are around the country who aren't able to go into visiting rooms now, especially as numbers continue to climb. We believe that the visiting room um, for the COVID nineteen numbers will begin are beginning to climb. We're seeing, you know, prison visit rooms, you know, become even more restrictive on letting visitation in, and so they're pointing more toward video visitation. And while uh, I guess pointed out that some DLCs are making a little bit of cash from this, um, which we want to see a little less of. All right, well, that's a whole other talk show. The question really is, um, should we be pushing for more video access inside of these facilities? Well, you know, that's interesting, right? Uh, so you know, I'm still in contact with a lot of people um, who are on, on the inside, a lot of the women who are very much family to me. I spent, you know, half of my life with them, almost as much time with them as I did my, my natural family. Um, and, and so when they call me and they're like, you know, we still haven't seen our families since March. Um, but they're starting to allow this video visitation. Um, it's still, they're still working out some of it. And I, I think it's like you said, we, wouldn't it be nice if we just did this for free for families? I mean, surely the state of Texas could come up with some type of system to do that. Um, so that part feels a little uncomfortable, but my fear is while this is, um, would be a good supplement, of course it would. I, I would take a video visit over no visit any day. Uh, my fear is because I just don't have a lot of faith in, in, in TDCJ, I don't. Um, is that they're going to use that to slowly whittle away physical um, contact visitation. That's my fear because that's what, when they started allowing for JPay and emails, I was like, oh, it's not going to be long before they start trying to get rid of mail. And, and I feel like that's kind of already started to happen. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. I mean, you know, in some ways it's good and in some ways we just we just really have to keep an eye on it and make sure that it, it stays supplemental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's wrap this up. I wanna, I wanna wave a magic wand, right? Um, for, for, this is for all of the attendees here, the policymakers, the wardens, the department head, all of the folks who are gonna be watching this. And they're gonna, the, one of the questions they're really gonna ask is why should we pay attention? Or what do you say to um, the, the response being, listen, security will not allow for this to happen. Or like this is supposed to be, you know, incarceration should be centered around punishment, um, punitive punishment, right? Maybe, even, right? Like they may go into heavy extreme. Um, but and then, and then we know that there's some very forward thinking um, correction officials and we're very excited about working with each of them to ensure that they're making stronger pathways for communication for people in there. But I really wanna know, what is your magic wand? Ta -da -da! This is going to happen next Monday. Rachel, I'm going to start with you. Um, then I'm going to pivot over to Jennifer. Um, and Denise, I'm going to get you to close it out. But if you guys could take literally like 30, 45 seconds to, to, to answer that question, wave your magic wand, what's going to happen? Okay. So first, as just like from the legal aspect, 
you know, people talk about the science behind families and things like that, but just like Jennifer said, the importance of building family connections. I have clients who have no family and it is very obvious when I have clients, I just had a client get resentenced today from 30 years to 14 years because he made a tremendous strides during his prison sentence so far because of his connections. And it was emotional to watch that. And I've had other clients that can come to court and they have nothing to offer because they have nobody and it, it really hurts them. So my magic wand would be to make things equal to inmates, equally accessible to all the inmates, because I think that there is a very big, at least in Florida, some inmates get treated differently because of financial ability um, and their inability to get access to certain things that other inmates do. And that's always something that's frustrating to me. So I would just, you know, make everything as accessible as possibly as they possibly can, just because a lot of stuff is pretty cheap. So I feel like if the courts can make people indigent, then we should be able to find a way to do that in prisons as well. So that's my little tip. <laughs> Jim. Uh, let's see, you know, it's funny, you mentioned punitive punishment, right? Because the more punitive um, incarceration was for me, the more likely I was to reoffend and I did. So the more it focused on restorative justice, which included um, connections, building stronger connections with my family, with my community, uh, with wanting to get involved in advocacy, um, the less likely I am to, to reoffend. I mean, you know, I, I can't even imagine myself going back to prison because of my ties to my community. Um, so if I could wave a magic wand, it would get uh, to have legislators and, and prison officials to understand the importance of involving the community and families. Because you can't ask a person that you've put away in a cage and say, you have to be a good citizen and you don't teach them how to do that. And you don't foster the connections that, that allow that um, to grow. And I think a huge part of that too um, would be providing for more mental health supports in, in schools for children um, um, and for those who are incarcerated and upon release. So that's what, that's what I would hope for. I love that. For all of you attendees, if you aren't familiar with the restorative justice practice, Google it right now. You're going to love what, what Jennifer is, what is, is meaning here. And I love the fact that you pointed out um, the, the, the conversation that you have with the kids in schools. That's awesome. It's very important. All right, Nice, ready? <laughs> sure. Uh, my magic wand would be to place the incarcerated as close to home as possible, not as far from home as possible. It is about these relationships. And when you put people as close to their family as possible, they're gonna be able to visit them. And it is the connections to their family that is going to get them through this and keep them well-behaved. Um, it's counterintuitive to ship them away from their family. But that thought process is actually what is causing the problem, not making the solution. Thank you, thank you about that. I'm gonna close out here. I'm gonna pass the ball back to Jesse. But I definitely want to take, I would be remiss if I didn't take one second to thank each one of you guys for joining this conversation. I've been home, I came home in 2004, and I'll tell you when I first came home, a lot of these conversations weren't being had. And as we learn more about the reform efforts that are going to be necessary to really advance family connections and what really it ends up to being reducing recidivism, I'm super grateful for you guys joining the conversation. Please follow each one of the, um, the, 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 the speakers here. Uh, on in their social media channels. I'm going to ask each one of you guys if you will drop your contact information in the chat um, so that all the attendees can have your information if they want to reach out to you directly. My information, you can always just at FlickShop on every platform. <laughs> I would love to talk to you guys and meet each one of you um, and say hello if you can. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining this in the conversation. I want to pass the ball back over to Jesse. Uh, this one was dope. Yes, I will echo Marcus. Thank you all so very much. And I think our attendees are going to see some people popping off video and popping back on. So I'm going to introduce our second panel, which is aimed at discussing what policies and practices can be changed to help facilitate some solutions. Uh, joining us for this discussion is Christina Toth. She's the administrator of the Family Connections Center at the New Hampshire Department of Corrections. Christina created one of the first family resource centers in the United States. Through collaborations and grant writing, Christina has helped grow Family Connections program and it's now housed in three separate prison facilities. We'll also have facility uh, Felicity Rose. She's the chief research and policy for criminal justice at forward.us. 
Forward is a bipartisan political organization that believes America's families, communities, and economy thrive when more individuals can achieve their full potential. Before joining Forward, Felicity worked as a senior associate with the Crime and Justice Institute, as well as with Pew's Public Safety Performance Project. Elizabeth Gaines is the CEO and president of the Osborne Association. Liz is a nationally recognized expert on the impact of incarceration and reentry on children and families. She designed Family Works, the first comprehensive parenting program in a men's state prison. She was the co-chair of the reentry working group for the New York City Mayor's Task Force on Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice and serves on the New York State Council on Community and Reentry and reintegration. Finally, our moderator for this panel is my friend and colleague, Emily Mooney. She is an R Street Fellow and has researched and written about the importance of family connections during incarceration. In her recent policy study, Emily wrote, behind most incarcerated individuals is a family that is critical to encouraging positive change on the inside and supporting them as they prepare for life on the outside. Emily, take it away. And of course, making sure I have- Emily, you're on mute. Muted, yes. Uh, thanks for introducing this panel, Jesse. I'm really excited to kick this off. Uh, some of the folks on this panel uh, I've seen of conferences and uh, I know there are, I'm sure a lot of people in the chat that we've also learned from uh, throughout our time working on this issue. Um, but I wanted to kick it off with Felicity um, and, and some of the work that Ford's doing. Felicity, your team at Ford.us worked with leading criminal justice researchers to develop one of the most recent, if not the most recent, you can clarify that for me, I believe so, uh, survey around the familial impact of incarceration. Can you walk us through some of the biggest findings around the sheer scope of people impacted and how this can differ across different demographic lines? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Emily, and I'm really excited to be part of this panel. So our research, um, which was came out, gosh, about two years ago, time flies, but uh, it's, it's a it's a pretty big project. So they're, you're right, they're not really frequent updates. Um, so I do think it's the most recent. Uh, what we found was that nearly half of all adults in the United States, about 100 and mil 113 million people um, have had a close family member spend at least a night in jail or prison, so be incarcerated at some point in their lives. Now, of course, many of those are really short stays and there can be different levels of impact. Um, and we did look at that as well, um, but a, a, lot, a, a shocking number are also long stays. And um, the way this differs from the way other people have looked at this is this does look at lifetime incarceration and because um, and seeing how broad that is when you really expand the definition and think about it over the course of everybody's past, not just who's in prison at this moment. Um, and so what we found is that um, one in seven adults in the United States has had an immediate family member incarcerated for more than a year. And one in 34 has had a loved one taken away for 10 years or more. Um, th these are like pretty stunning numbers when you think about it. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do this research and, and talk about this was to help people understand that this is not an isolated phenomenon and that mass incarceration in the United States has grown to touch everybody in our communities. Um, and when we looked at kind of how this broke down by different groups, of course, um, we actually did see that it touches people really across the board. So politically, um, Democrats, Republicans, no difference in terms of the rates of incarceration but it also does fall much more heavily on certain communities. So particularly low-income communities and communities of color. And that's not surprising since those are the folks we, we see tend to be incarcerated that those families would be most impacted, but it does compound the harm in a lot of ways um, that I think we'll talk about more through the panel. Um, but specifically we saw a, a really big distinction, especially when you looked at the longer term incarceration. So black adults were 50% more likely than white adults to have had any immediate family member incarcerated for any amount of time, but they were three times more likely than white adults to have had someone in prison for uh, longer than a year. So when you were talking about prison incarceration and, and even longer, you know, 10 years or more kind of um, numbers that really was falling very, very heavily on black people and also on low income people. Thank you. 
Let's see, your, your survey also found that only 24% of people with an incarcerated loved, uh, loved one were, were ever able to visit during their term. Now, of course, from what you just said, maybe part of that is also that it was a very short stay, but also thinking through that fairly matches some of the older BJS data, or Bureau of Justice Statistics data around visitation as well. Um, and among, so among those with longer sentences, that number was still low, around 49%. How do these numbers provide context for where and how we need to improve family connection policy? Yeah, so I think um, two things are driving that. The first is the income disparities I already highlighted. So a lot of the, the very people who are most likely to have a family member incarcerated are the people who can't afford to take time off work, who don't have a car to drive out to these prisons, um, which that's the second part, the prisons, the geographic disparities, the bulk of people behind bars in this country are in state prisons, which are far away from the urban areas where impacted people are, mo are more likely to live. And so it's, it's very hard to get out there if you don't have a car. Um, they may not be able to pay for a hotel if you have to stay overnight because it's far away. Um, and so, and we also know that a lot of incarcerated people were the primary wage earner for the family before they were incarcerated. And so there's even less room in a budget to care for the family and pay for these extra expenses once they're gone. And so I think structurally we've set up a system where the people who should be able to visit, who need to maintain those connections are the ones who have the least ability to do so. Um, and then you're also adding on now, you know, the pandemic, of course, phone calls, video calls were talked about often costing money that people do not have. Um, and so all of that adds up to create those huge barriers to connection. In terms of what I would recommend to bridge that, I'm sure other people have a lot of great ideas, but, you know, free transportation and lodging for families, if they can, people being housed closer to home, those, you know, uh, those prisons or, or facilities being closer to population centers. Um, and right now, a lot of, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of states did put in place some free phone use when um, there was uh, with the original lockdown. I don't know that people have been uh, tracking that, if that's continuing in all the states. There was kind of a lot of attention at first, and then this just drags on and on and on. Um, and a lot of those policies, I think, were like, oh, for a month, everyone gets 15 minutes. Um, but, as, you know, you're talking about kids who are growing up and going a year without being able to see their parents. So it's really concerning. And I would say, um, you know, encouraging states and to see that as uh, a, a really key part of the policy right now um, and a place to direct resources. Thank you for all of those points. Um, shifting to Christina, with your, your inside of the Department of Corrections working on trying to build family connections, build spaces and, and avenues for, for making um, as much as possible, mitigating some of those collateral consequences that sometimes fall on, on kids and family members, as well as the loved one who's behind bars. What is, I mean, tell us a little bit more of the history of work of the center um, and, and some of the challenges and successes you've seen both before and during COVID. Sure. Um, so first of all, I, um, 1998 is when I looked to create a family resource center and I looked to Elizabeth Gaines Osborne Association, what they were doing, and I modeled our program after a lot of what they were doing, and then I looked around um, the state of New Hampshire, New England, and to see about family resource centers in the community, and I kind of melded the two together. So we created, I believe, the first family resource center in the state prison, and right now we're in all of the state prisons. Um, I want to back up also, is that New Hampshire is a small state. So we were very lucky because like right now we're in every single prison, we're statewide, everything we do is statewide. I've always felt very strongly about that instead of doing one thing at one prison to do it for all of the, all the parents at all the prisons. So um, we started this in 98 and it was at a co-ed prison. I know there's very few of those and it doesn't exist anymore, but we were seeing um, grandparents coming and bringing a child to drop off to visit with mom, then wait three hours and visit with dad. And we're like, okay, something's going on here. So we. Um, reached out and worked. I was working for the Department of Corrections at that time in a different program. And we worked with the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension and the University of New Hampshire Family Studies Department to try to, you know, get together with resources and um, research. I mean, we really, you know, looked at looked at the research to see what was out there, what's going to work, the importance of family from the Family Studies Department. And um, 
threw together this program and it's pretty much stayed the same through different grants or through more education. We've, we've enlarged and expanded, but our basic program is an 18 hour parenting education class, a 10 hour healthy relationships class, weekly parenting support groups. And another thing that I've done is you never stop being a parent. I mean, we do um, kind of limit to 18 and under, but if a child, if a parent and a child has been in our program for years and they go on to college or military, we'll continue some of the programming because they're still kids. But um, that was kind of unique for the prison is they always have a beginning and end of a program. What do you mean? It just keeps going. You don't finish. I'm like, because you don't finish being a parent. So um, weekly parenting support groups. And if a person becomes, um, stays disciplinary report free and attends these groups, then a whole bunch of other options open up for them. And we have a um, summer camp program where children go to camp for two weeks at a YMCA overnight camp. And they come into the prison and spend two days with their mom or dad doing art projects and music. We have um, televisits. Right now we use Skype. We might be changing, but we do those every other week. During COVID, we switched to weekly because we weren't allowed to run groups at that time. We have a lot of life skills seminars. We have a lot of volunteers come in from the outside and use their expertise to teach about anything to do with kids, families, relationships, nutrition. We do, um, I think what else, the audio recording audiobooks. So we send those home to the children three times a year or more. Along with brand new books, we have a big literacy program in the prison, and that's for all um, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, that they can pick out a brand new book and they send that home to their children. So uh, family fun day where the, um, we kind of shut down the visiting room or in one of our facilities, we go outside and actually have a barbecue. It's amazing. And um, we have games and food and the regular visiting room rules don't apply at that point because normally you have to sit in assigned seats. You can't get out of your seats unless you go to the play area. And we kind of have it a free for all. We have a pinata and things like that. So I've been very lucky. Um, we've gone through a lot of supervisors in my 22 years here. I've had nine commissioners and 10 directors. And through it all, we've been able to stay afloat and actually grow. And um, the key to that, I think, is having, well, I know it is, is having partnerships. I couldn't have done it alone with the DOC, especially with budget cuts and things like that. It wouldn't have lasted. And sometimes some of those supervisors aren't so supportive. And so then you kind of have to pull in those partners to say, hey, this is important and family is important and it reduces recidivism and there's a money saver. And so by having, I think a university is really helpful, having the research and, and um, someone who can speak as an expert and then having a community agency, a social service agency. So a lot of um, our grants and donations don't come to the Department of Corrections. Working through a state agency is very difficult. So they go to our partner agency and then they come in kind of that way. Um, hiring staff. So I have a lot of staff that work for me that technically aren't Department of Correction staff, but they come in to the facility and kind of as a volunteer, but more of a contracted staff. So they still work for me in all capacities, but their paycheck is from another place. So that is the program. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to add one more. So we got the second chance grant this year. And so the pieces we're adding, um, we had a pilot program before it's family counseling. So we were doing family counseling via televisiting before COVID. And um, it took a while to get off the ground. And interesting enough, now that COVID has happened and I think the world is much um, more used to working with video visiting and things, I think as we start the project back up again, I think there'll be more people, including a lot of therapists weren't that comfortable with it. And I think we'll have more people that are willing to do that. We are also doing parenting check-in because we have these um, parents that have been in the prison and they've been in a support group. Some of them are 10 years. So every week for 10 years, we see them, we talk with them, they leave prison and where's that support? And um, sometimes they reach back to us, which is nice, but they get busy. So now we're gonna implement a structured formal program where they can, we'll have staff call them. It'll be, um, it'll slowly decrease. So they might get out, we'll call them every other week and then every other month and then every three months, things like that. And then my um, the biggest piece I'm most excited about this grant is we're working with all the um, prisons and jail or the prisons were part of the prisons, but the uh, jails in New Hampshire, and we have 10 separate jails that are in 10 separate counties with 10 separate rules. And we are, um, I have all the jails have agreed along with the prison that when a parent becomes incarcerated, if a minor child, they're going to get a referral and we'll send it to the local family resource center in the community. So the ch children in New Hampshire, any of them who have an incarcerated parent, will then be reached out to by a family resource center to make sure they have food and fuel and support. And they're going to um, run support groups for the children and the caregivers for us. I think that's it. 
Well, this is, that is just a beautiful array of programming. And I want to give you credit for working, you know, in the system and in promoting change and through all the changes uh, in agency structure and leadership and fighting, fighting for that cause and having that vision for the future. Um, Liz, I mean, Osborne Association really f founded the large body of, of this work, particularly when it comes to, to kids and families and supporting them. Um, can you share a little bit about your story, both how you entered this work and, and how Osborne is, for folks who are less familiar with the Osborne Association, um, they've worked in numerous New York prisons and jails and really developed curriculum that's used across the country. Um, but yeah, tell us a little, little bit about the work you do and what practically that, that looks like and, and now has looked like during COVID. Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, the Osborne Association was founded by this pioneer, Thomas Mott Osborne, who um, was actually the warden of Sing Sing Prison in 1914 and then became a, known as the pioneer and prophet of prison reform. So we do work across criminal justice. Um, I had actually started my career as a prisoner's rights lawyer and knew the New York system. But, um, and I've been there for 36 years and the second, first year after I arrived, um, we were really doing most alternatives to incarceration, other justice programs. My kids were two and six and their father was arrested. And, uh, but it was in Virginia. And so as I began this framing, he and I, at this point were separated, but I really believed uh, that children should have parents and, you know, he was there when we made them. So they're, that's his, their dad and he was just going to have to step up wherever he was. But, you know, I had a job. I could drive 500 miles and pay for a motel at, overnight and teach my kids to swim in a Holiday Inn swimming pool, but that is not mostly people's experience. But even then in New York, I discovered for my own kids, like as soon as families found out about their father, my daughter was six, her play dates were canceled. Every time something went wrong at school, they assumed it was my son because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So I had to learn a lot about it. And so I couldn't do very much about the horrible visiting in Virginia, but uh, because I had worked in the New York system and because I was a daddy's girl and knew that the men who ran the prison system in New York had daughters, I was able to convince them that fathers mattered, even if they were incarcerated. And they let me kind of run wild, uh, opening a, I wanted to do a comprehensive parenting program where we didn't just do a parenting course inside, but also worked with the families outside. But the other thing was I wanted a family center in the visiting room so that when children came to visit, they did not have the experience my kids did in Virginia uh, where they were not treated well by the staff, where it, it was just, you know, horrible and nothing to do all day. And you got to remember, New York has seven day a week, all day visits in maximum security prisons, weekend all day visits and holidays in medium security prisons, and a family reunion program for overnight visiting. New York has a very, very strong belief in uh, the last commissioner is on my board of directors. This is not, uh, this, this wasn't an outlier, right? This was the department believing that good programs are good security and that families matter. Now, unfortunately, they're sort of all over the place. So we started this program, Family Works. Originally, it was a 16-week parenting class. Then we added healthy relationships. And now we've added connected couples so that people's intimate partners come in and we work with them together on the relationship. We also hire uh, civilian staff as well as what the prison calls inmate caregivers. We don't call them that because we don't ever use the word inmate, but incarcerated people have their prison job is they're trained in how to be in this family center. They learn how to play every game, read every book, ride a rocking chair. Um, we used to have computers that took them out, but we have activities where kids can be totally, you know, with the parents all day. The kids, this isn't like send the kids to a center. This is the dad has to come in with the child. This is for them to be together, not to avoid a, a you know, sort of a visit. Um, later, we started working with the women's prison that is 400 miles from New York City. And we did a parenting class, but because of the distance, we were very fortunate that um, a local church, St. James Episcopal Church, supported us and we now, as well as state corrections, 
So at the end of the class, we fly all of the kids from New York City, JetBlue, up to Rochester, and then take a bus and stay overnight at a hotel, and local volunteers help us. And so they get to do the graduation from the program with their moms. We just, we also added, uh, so that's, uh, so Family Works and Family Ties are in nine prisons. Um, we also have visitor hospitality centers at 16 prisons where the staff sits just outside so that when people come, they have, they could be welcome. Sometimes they will have driven all night. So they get coffee. If they're wearing the wrong clothes, we give them better clothes. We help them register. If someone can't go in, they can stay there while the other people go in. This is something, all of, the, all of that is funded by the New York State Department of Correctional Services with additional support. So Family Works and the visitor centers together are about a million dollars of funding. And I say this because people spend tons of money on prison and prisons can afford to do this if they're committed to doing it um, because of the size of, of their budgets. At some point we added video visiting. And you'll notice I also don't say visitation ever because none of us goes to visitate with our moms, we visit her. And so um, we began looking at video as a supplement. I think um, the prior panelists mentioned how important that was, I think it was Jennifer, um, that we wanna make sure that New York would never replace it. So it's free, but the family comes to our office and that way, while the child is visiting in a supported visit with a social worker, we can make sure that people are getting support, but at the same time, the family member who brings the child, who may not have a great relationship with the incarcerated person, um, gets that kind of support, but it is free and has now been expanded to, to, uh, to many, many more facilities, which has really helped during COVID, where we've been able to um, expand that. So, I mean, that's kind of a lot, but I just, I wanted to mention all that. And then we are not the only organization in New York that does work, right? With, there's a lot of other uh, programs to make sure that visiting, we recently, thank goodness, got uh, the legislature to pass and it's sitting on the governor's desk, a bill that would require the state to consider where the child lives when they decide where, in which of our 54 prisons, a, a parent will be placed. Um, for several years, we've been trying to get restoration of our free visiting bus program because prisons are very far away. And so the idea is to make them uh, more accessible. The other thing, frankly, is like in New York City, we, we just finished training 240 correction officers on uh, interacting with children because we know that for so many kids, that person in uniform represents the police and it can have a lifelong impact on how they are uh, how they're treated and how people sort of feel about them. It's really important. When my, when my kids were little, my daughter once saw, we were at Mecklenburg prison where the death row was and they saw uh, those, some of those guys coming out and they were dressed differently. My daughter asked the CO, who are those guys? Says, oh, those are the ones we're gonna fry. And if your father doesn't behave himself, we're gonna fry him. And so these kinds of lifelong traumas that affect kids, of course, my daughter responded by teaching in our parenting class, starting programs for children of incarcerated parents um, and becoming a cottage industry, but not all kids have that kind of support. So I think it's, there's a broad array of things that, that can be done, should be done. Thank you. Thank you for that response and, and the work that Osborne is doing and the, the work that your family is, is a part of that. Um, so Felicity, for you, this issue is also not just academic, it also has personally affected you. Listening to some of what Liz and Christina described and what you've also seen from your, your work and policy work, uh, how, how does that differ or, or jive with your own experiences with family connections? Yeah, so my father was in and out of federal prison when I was a child and we experienced many of the challenges that um, have been highlighted. Um, and, you know, one obvious one is that he was moved from a prison about 300 miles away from us where we were able to sometimes visit um, to a, a prison 1600 miles away. And, that, you know, that was very hard for me to understand as a little kid, um, why we suddenly couldn't see him anymore. Um, but the thing that I return to is that for me, I, I didn't want him to be at a prison five hours away. I wanted him to be at home, 
right? And so that's what guides a lot of our work at Forward is really seeing the connections between the policies that put people and keep people in prison and the impacts on, on families and individuals and seeing that those are one thing. So for us, um, for me, you don't fix, I mean, I, <laughs> it's hard because all of these programs to keep those connections there are incredibly important and, and taking care of the children and families and the people inside who are there right now are, are incredibly important. And I don't want to diminish that at all, but to say that our approach is about trying to change the you know, change the laws in the system so that people don't go to the prison at all, because we know that um, there's, a, there's a lot of research and there's a lot of personal experience that tells us that this doesn't make people safer. It doesn't, in a lot of cases, re, you know, most cases rehabilitate them, that there's, you know, when you look at the United States, every state in the United States compared to other countries, or you look within the United States from, from state to state, we work um, at the state level in New York, but also in some other very uh, states with much higher incarceration rates. And you see that the difference is there. You see that it doesn't help, right? Having higher incarceration rates, having more people in prison does not help. And so, and it creates all these collateral consequences. So I think it's um, the part that for us really matters is that these are, these are people who we're putting in prison. They're people with families and there are ripple effects. Um, and we need to think about those when, when we're thinking about policy and, and what we want our society to look like um, and not just think, okay, that person committed a crime, therefore here's the punishment, but recognize that you are um, also punishing the family, that you are having all these other consequences and impacts. Yeah, that's a really, a really great point. I know uh, states like Washington, Oregon have kind of led on thinking through primary care uh, responsibilities and, and using sentencing alternatives, particularly for those parents and even having specialized caseloads to support those family members, you know, that they're, they're not just getting the same routine probation requirements, but actually they're building stronger families as a result of that intervention rather than weakening them. And I think even uh, New Orleans is, is working towards that with a, a primary caregiver alternative to incarceration. So very important work. Um, I know we only have, you know, 15 minutes or so left. Uh, folks in the audience, feel free to submit questions. But I, going off of Marcus's last question, if you had a magic wand, what would be the change? What would you, really, what would you, I know we have correctional administrators and, and agencies on this call too. What, what would you like them to do right now, uh, you know, both within their administrative power, but then for policymakers and legislators, how can they help this issue? Uh, so for listening, maybe I'll kick it off with you since you we kind of you kind of talked about alternatives to incarceration there as the, the main thing. Is there anything that you would also have correctional agencies do? Yeah, I mean, you know, at this moment with the pandemic, I think it's not enough to have uh, expiring programs to get 15 minutes of phone calls a week. I mean, you need more free access to communication tools. So more free video, free phone calls. I know it doesn't replace visitation at all, um, but it's also not safe right now for a lot of people to see each other. And we do have to protect the people who are inside and not, and try to keep COVID out of those institutions where we know it it will run wild. And so it's a, it's a hard balancing act. Um, for legislators, policymakers, um, you know, remembering this point that people are, are people, uh, people in prison are people too. They have families, they have communities who are all impacted. Um, and thinking broadly about this problem, not focusing on a narrow solution, but, you know, maybe the solution right now is actually to send people home uh, <laughs> during the pandemic. I mean, you've seen a few states do this safely. We've had you know, actually quite low crime rates throughout the pandemic. Um, even when jail populations went way down, they stopped arresting people early on, it didn't seem safe. So um, we know that we can release people and send people home safely to their families to shelter at home uh, and both maintain family connection and keep people, um, for, you know, safe from the pandemic. Um, so there are I would just encourage people to think about these issues broadly and, and really recognize the try and foreground that humanity. Thank you. Christina, you got the magic wand now. What what would you what would you change? Um, 
so uh, again, been very lucky to be able to do what I've done, but the, they, the department supports and allows us to exist, which is amazing and wonderful. But um, I don't think we're seen as experts and the family support for the families of our residents doesn't go all, you know, there's not a lot of communication. And when things get changed in the visiting room, such as all the crayon drawings came out and all the postcard, you know, there was never ever any consultation with the Family Connection Center. And we're all child support, I mean, child development experts, and this is what we've done for 22 years. So there has never been discussions with, we know that piece, or when um, we had a new visiting policy that came in, this whole other form has to be notarized every year. Again, no conversation with us and families are really frustrated and, and just the lack of communication. So kind of taking what we do, but expanded across the department and to involve the families and to update the families as soon as you know something and to, you know, things like that to support. And as far as legislation, um, there is not legislation. We don't have our own budget really. So we could, if I you know got a supervisor that said, nah, we don't want to do that, it's gone. There's nothing that says that we have to exist. And I know some states, California, there's Children Bill of Rights. So having something like that in legislature and within our own department, having say our own budget, I'm amazed what New York, that New York Department of Corrections, you know, can do that. So that's amazing um, that they actually pay for the programming. So uh, a lot of what I, when I started the program, we were about a quarter state funded. We are now probably three quarters. So it has grown again, which is amazing, but we uh, rely a lot on private funds and donations to um, do what we're doing. So I'd like to make it more solid so it's not willy-nilly just because someone really likes you this year or next year type thing. Thank you. Liz, what would what would you change? Well, we have a we do have a bill pending on visiting codification which would make it that prisons and jails cannot eliminate in person visiting. Um that would give people a right to visiting, but I I agree with Felicity and well really ever that you have to look at the whole arc of arrest through reentry and its impact on families. We're working now with the Buffalo Police Department, other police departments on child sensitive arrest policies that we worked on with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Like what happens when a parent is arrested and a child is present? What are we doing there? Alternatives. Um, and very importantly, in and on the on the reentry end, to not make these distinctions that these programs or parents relate to whether it's a violent, whether they call a crime violent or not violent. That is a ridiculous um, distinction, frankly. It has to do, you know, I, I can understand asking is the person dangerous or not dangerous, but we're talking about keeping people three, four times longer than any other country thinks about. My kid's dad, who thought he was gonna be in for 10 years, he did 25 years. By the time he came home, he wasn't even, I mean, he wasn't able to do anything that the kids had counted on all that time. And so even this parents, Parenting Sentencing Alternative Act that's I'm um, delighted is, is sort of finding its way in the federal government, again, nonviolent offenses. So I would say um, release people basically after a much shorter period of time. Um, if you're really doing the work inside and keeping people connected to their families, they will not pose a risk. Um, and I think that, that those are the kinds of things we need to be looking at is the entire arc from arrest to reentry. Um, and parole and other people should give families more credit. They are the reentry program of first and last resort, and we should be supporting them. I want to say first publicly, we've just got support from Trinity Church Wall Street to do a kinship reentry program, which would allow us. To, to reimburse families for some of the costs of having somebody come home. Because right now we're releasing 6,000 people a year from prison directly into New York City shelters um, and not supporting families who want to support their loved ones. So if we could do all that. <laughs> Perfect, right? Easy, easy lift, um, necessary lift though. And, and uh, speaking to some of the points you, you talked about, a bit, the right to visitation, I know if Denise was on this panel, she'd probably point out some of the, the Florida regulatory changes that uh, restrict visitation in some cases for dif different disciplinary or infractions, which, you know, again, maybe a uh, first look that makes sense. But if you actually think through the consequences of that, that visitation is a buffer, it's a strengthening mechanism. It's something that connects someone to the outside and gives them motivation and just encouragement that like they're not just who they are in, in that cell. Um, that that doesn't make any sense to limit that, you know, no matter what someone's doing that. that well, also, then you're punishing the child who didn't do anything. 
Exactly, exactly. Um, now, kind of off of that, that note, uh, cost and facility concerns are often two of the biggest barriers for kind of focusing for the department, say, focusing on on strong uh, pro-social family connections. Uh, Liz, you you spoke to an incredible budget from the New York Department of Corrections. Um, I'm, I'm curious, and, and other folks feel free to tune in here, what was the messaging? I mean, it sounds like that buy-in has just like kind of been in there from the get-go, but what is the messaging when they're talking to legislators and asking for that, you know, that funding or to other groups that that has been key to having a sustainable funding source as well as within, sorry, this is a two-part question, within your programming, I mean, kids being able to interact freely, Christina, yours as well. Um, how do you get past those costs and, and kind of public safety or facility safety concerns uh, and get that buy-in from correctional staff? Well, first of all, we didn't start getting a million dollars a year, right? We started with a foundation grant for $35,000 and a bunch of volunteers. And then they said, this is crazy. You can't have all, you know, why are you want to be make it visiting nights? Then kids are going to want to go to prison. It's like, you're right. But what happened was when we went from Sing Sing and moved to another prison, oh no, the first day, oh, first day that our staff didn't show up and we couldn't open the visiting room after they'd been talking about it like that, I get a call from the watch commander at nine o'clock in the morning. Liz, is anybody going to show up? The kids are running all over the place. Isn't somebody coming in? And so we started where there was actually the corrections people could see the difference. They saw that people wanted to behave better to get those privileges for their families. They saw that people behaved better when they were getting parenting classes. They saw that people that took parenting were more likely to program in other places. And so what starts small when they can see that it makes a difference. Once we started opening family centers in the other prison, we didn't go. We sent the visiting sergeant from Sing Sing to go to the next prison. Let him tell the visiting people that this was a good idea and how visiting went better. So I think that that it, you have to start small. You demonstrate the difference. Um, look, New York is a, is a big system. So a million dollars is a lot of money that was came from the governor, but it started first with the foundation then with one single legislator giving us a grant, we just expanded to Buffalo, which was one state senator from Buffalo saying, we think this isn't right that it's only in New York City. We want video and support up here. Um, but you continue to, I think, you know, you talk about the kids, they didn't do anything wrong. We, we educate people about ACEs and adverse childhood experiences. We don't use that message that says, oh, if you don't do this, these kids are going to wind up in prison like their parents, which is A, not true, um, and B, ridiculous. You're just criminalizing children. What you are saying is the truth, which is that this is an avoidable trauma if we engage, well, lock up fewer people and then do what we can to, uh, to address the trauma. And, you know, like I said, when I first went in there, they were daddies too. Like they know that, that parents matter. The other thing, which corrections may not support me on this one, but New York is different for another reason. We had Attica. And in, and in the face of that, many things changed. College came into prison, the barriers in the visiting room went down, family reunion was added. Uh, we, were, we were forced as a state to reckon with things that maybe other states have, have not. But, um, but basically it's run by people that actually love their children, believe in their children, and believe that parenting will make a difference. So I was um, pretty similar to Liz on that, always talking about the children. So when uh, we started the program, again, we were working with family um, studies department. But when I went out and talked to recruit volunteers or money, we talked about the children. We talked about real children and their stories. And then the other, um, and then, so when I started the program too, because corrections has existed, you know, hundreds of years and um, the corrections officers are taught to not talk about families and not to care about the families of the um, people they're working with. So I went to every single shift at every single prison and talked to the officers and said, you know, these kids are in school with your kids and do you want them to be happy and safe and secure and knowing that they are loved by their incarcerated parent or not? And it, some of them have probably never thought about that, that the, their kids are going to school together. So that was a kind of just a odd but eye opener for them. And then the other one was um, humanizing our incarcerated parents. I'd have a lot of our funders come into the facility, into our program and meet the incarcerated mothers and fathers. And I'd walk them out, they're like, wow, they're, 
they're just a dad. I'm like, yeah, they're just a dad. And that, I mean, was a huge eye opener for people that, you know, these are smart, educated people, but there's just a barrier or they're seeing what they're seeing on TV. And um, we made it real for them. These are real families, real dads, real moms and real kids that miss and love their parents. Thank you. I see. I see Jess uh, uh, popping back up on the screen there. I do. I want to recognize that uh, a couple of folks from Florida said that they are no longer having the free uh, phone calls um, past the past the pandemic that was started at the beginning. So again, speaking to your point, a lot of those COVID nineteen related changes were great, but now that we're in month what is this nine, <laughs> seven? I'm losing track, as I'm sure many other people are. Um, we're seeing, you know, seeing those just start to slip away. And then as states come back to their budgets next year, if they don't prioritize family connections, there's a danger of, of things uh, receding even further. Um, thank you each of, and every one of you for joining this panel for the, the work that you're doing on these issues and for sharing your stories and experiences and expertise. Um, it's likewise as the panel before, if you feel comfortable with folks reaching out, if you could drop your, your Twitter or email address, um, whatever, um, you would like to do, and I'll let uh, Jess, Jess reach, uh, wrap us up. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope that this is just the beginning of a longer and more robust conversation. We hope that we can facilitate connections between everyone who attended and everyone who offered to speak and share their expertise today. Please, if you have any questions or concerns or comments at all, reach out to Emily or myself. Our contact information is on the screen right now. And I don't know if I said this earlier, but there will be a recorded link of this event. So if there's anyone you know that you think should see this or you wanna share it with anyone at all, uh, let us know and we'll be able to provide that for you. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day.